So you're thinking about coding. Maybe you've heard it's just a good skill to learn, or perhaps there's a particular project you'd like to build. Either way, over the next few minutes or so, I'm going to explain exactly how and why you should code in 2024. So specifically, we're going to start off with why you should learn to code, then we're going to move on to the different programming languages we have available, and which ones you should focus on based on your own interests and goals. After that, we're going to move on to the different tools and resources we have available. And then finally, we're going to end this video with some book recommendations, as well as some additional learning resources that you can use to accelerate your learning. Just a quick FYI, this video is largely aimed at beginner to intermediate level, but even if you're a seasoned developer, hopefully there's still something you can take from this video. So let's get into it. So firstly, I think it's worth pointing out that with the recent advancements in AI and more specifically generative AI, there are rumors circulating that these days it's not actually worth learning to code since the code can actually be generated for you. But I would highly object to that point. To understand why, we have to go back to why we have languages and programming languages in the first place. We have languages such as English to be able to roughly translate our thoughts into words, but these are always going to be loose and non-precise, which is why languages and even mathematics overall has been invented in the first place, because it reduces and avoids that ambiguity. So for example, if we type into ChatGPT something like create me the code for a website, not only do we need to know what to do with that code, but also even if that website is particularly impressive, it's going to be non-precise and knowing what exactly you're looking for involves being very specific with your language, but never is it going to be as specific as the code itself. This is why we have programming languages in the first place, because if we want to do something very specific, the machine or the computer only understands very specific and non-ambiguous code, which is why understanding how that code works and being able to speak or work with that particular language means that you can actually get from the point of something abstract to something tangible and concrete. This is why I think AI is best thought of as a co-pilot, because it can help you with troubleshooting whether you've come across a particular error and you can help you solve it. Or there's something a little bit more abstract that you're trying to solve. AI can actually help you with that process. In addition, AI is very good at creating a boilerplate or some kind of scaffold or skeleton rather than having to do everything from scratch. Therefore, once that's done, you can simply make tweaks and modifications rather than starting with nothing. So now we've covered that, what are actually the benefits to coding overall? Well, first of all, programming is probably the closest thing we have to magic in the modern world because we can almost create anything into software. You're a wizard, Harry. Not only this, but there are huge financial and business opportunities when it comes to programming. And if you think about it, for much of human history, in order to be wealthy, you probably had to have handed to you that wealth from one generation to the next. But in these times, you can simply become a millionaire or a billionaire just by having a good software project. Okay, obviously I'm oversimplifying, but if you think about it, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, a lot of these people who are some of the wealthiest people in the world got to where they are purely because they had good technologies. So if you have an idea that you think has huge business potential and all that's required is having someone build it, well then either you can learn to code yourself or find programmers to work with. But either way, knowing the basics of coding might help you actually narrow down your search for a good competent programmer. Broadly speaking, to be truly financially successful, you have to have at least one of the following skills, the ability to sell something or the ability to build something. But what I find is that if you have some experience with both, this can take you to the next level. And this brings us on to the whole idea of leverage. And the more leverage we have, the bigger the task that we can actually achieve. As Naval Ravikant says, there are three different forms of leverage. The first being people, the second is capital, and the third is roughly speaking technology, but really this is anything that has a zero or low cost of replication. So for example, printing or writing would fall into this category because in theory, you only have to write something once for it then to be made available to everyone else at low or zero cost. The leverage of people is still the one that is most associated with status because generally people are quite impressed if you have people working under you or for you. Capital or money is also very powerful because if you know how to invest it, you can pretty much get anything done. However, the leverage of people is also the least efficient because it brings with it an overhead in terms of managing those people and they're the least reliable. Also, they have to work only within a certain time frame and then rest outside of that. Whereas capital, in theory, can get anything done at any time. 
The downside to capital though is it often comes with a risk. You have to invest your money and there's often no guarantee that you'll get what you paid for. This is why the third form of leverage is the most efficient because it's the most guaranteed, the most secure, and it also has the most possibilities, particularly in the modern age. So hopefully I've sold you on the whole idea of programming and why learning to code can really unlock so many possibilities, both in your career and in terms of your own passion projects. So the next step is if you're a complete beginner or your experience is limited, knowing which route to go down or more specifically, which technologies and programming languages to learn can be really important. So the way I'm gonna break this down is into different streams. And depending on your own personal interests or which area you think has the most potential, you probably wanna to gravitate to one of these different areas. These three different streams are web development, data science, AI, machine learning, or app development. And each of these requires different technologies and different skills to try and comprehend. Web development, as the name implies, is anything to do with web pages. So whether you want to create or design front end user experiences, or you wanna code some of the back end that goes into the storage and maintenance and serving of those web pages, then this particular stream is the one for you. The next one is data science. So this is less about what the user sees and more about how information gets processed. Having a solid understanding of data science means that you can branch into things such as machine learning, AI, even generative AI similar to ChatGPT. All of these technologies can be bundled, roughly speaking, under the umbrella of data science. And finally, we have app development. And once again, as the name implies, it involves creating applications, usually for mobile devices, but it can also apply to desktop applications as well. So probably at this point, you have a rough idea which of these streams is most interesting to you, and then you can go ahead and research further. But I'm also gonna give you a rough outline for the different technologies you should learn and a rough pathway so that you can start here and then progress slowly towards the end goal of mastering that particular stream. So on screen, here is the web development pathway. And you wanna start with the fundamental technologies, which are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. With these three things, you can pretty much create anything. Although as you'll see, as we move on, we will create or use technologies to actually make this process a little bit more efficient and a little bit more maintainable in the long run. In short, HTML is the language that you use to add particular items to a web page, which are called elements. So an element could be anything from an image to a heading or even paragraph text. So once you understand how HTML works, you can pretty much add anything to a web page, even if it doesn't stylistically look correct. This is where CSS comes into play, because once you've added each element that you actually want, you can then go ahead and style it. And once you've styled all the elements individually and collectively, it creates a really impressive and visually appealing user interface. And then we have JavaScript, which is the programming language that we use to manipulate those elements or sometimes even the styles as well. So for example, if we want some particular interaction to occur, like clicking on one box triggers something else on the page to render or appear or change, then JavaScript is the thing that we're gonna to use to make this happen. So once we've got the fundamentals of these three technologies, we can move on to things like Node.js and React. And Node.js is actually JavaScript, but it allows you to run it on the server side rather than the client side. So what I mean by this is the client side is what the user sees. So if you go onto a web browser, type in a particular web URL, and then a website comes back, this is happening on the client side, or at least the website that you see is on the client side, which is your own computer. The server side is the aspect that actually serves that content in the first place. So this handles what to do when you actually request that information. React is another JavaScript library, and there are some alternatives to this, but essentially, even though it might seem unnecessary at the start because you're adding some initial complexity, in the long run, it actually makes the process of building larger applications a lot more efficient and a lot more maintainable, rather than having to code everything manually in JavaScript, which not only is cumbersome, but it's also a bit messy as well. Next.js is then like another abstraction on top of both of these things. So in Next.js, you have React, you have Node, and you have HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And it kind of bundles them all together to create a mechanism or framework that makes coding in those languages a lot more practical for large scale web applications. The next stream is the data science and machine learning pathway. And here, you almost always wanna start with Python. 
as this has the largest community for machine learning as well as some of the most useful libraries. There are tons of resources available to help you learn Python and this could be books, online courses and many other examples that are both interactive or something that you can read in your own time. But definitely getting to grips with Python is the first step in this journey. After that, you wanna learn the basics of frameworks such as NumPy and SciPy. And these are all about data manipulation. So when you're working with large quantities of data, you wanna be able to manipulate and work with them in the most efficient way, because it can take a lot of time to process this information if it's not in an efficient form. After that, we can start adding in some of the machine learning frameworks. And the most basic one, in the sense that it's used for some of the more generic machine learning operations is scikit-learn. PyTorch and TensorFlow, on the other hand, are used for some of the more intricate and complicated operations, often involving deep learning. And the last stream then is app development. And by far the most popular area to develop apps for is mobile applications. And here we have basically two choices, depending on whether you wanna focus on iOS or Apple devices or Android devices. For Apple devices, you wanna learn the programming language Swift. And then on top of this, you can add in a particular framework which is the common way to do things now, which is Swift UI. And this is kind of like the HTML and JavaScript equivalent of Swift that allows you to put things in place, declare what kind of components you wanna use or elements, and then from this, you can manipulate them using the Swift language. The Android equivalent is Java, or more recently, Kotlin, which is very similar to Java, and it's kind of built on some of the main fundamentals and origins of Java, but it's a lot more modern and has some more modern features. Again, with all of these streams, programming languages, and frameworks, there are so many online resources that can help you. But the goal of this video is to just give you an idea of where to start and where to progress from and towards. So before we move on to the next section, I just wanna quickly point out that technically, a lot of these programming languages and sometimes frameworks are more versatile than I'm initially implying. What I mean is, for example, you can use Python for web development or JavaScript for data science, but this isn't too common and you'll find that if you go down these routes, you'll often come across some kind of limitation in the long run. So I would say as a general rule of thumb, unless you really know what you're doing or you have a strong reason to go down one of these alternative routes, I would say stick with the conventional route and learn the technology that is best served for that particular purpose. So in terms of tools then, in order to help you with your programming journey, I would say the first thing you need is an IDE. An IDE just stands for Integrated Development Environment. And this is just a fancy way of saying a code editor. So if you think of Microsoft Word being used to create documents, then an IDE is used to create applications. By far the most popular IDE in recent times is Visual Studio Code, or sometimes called VS Code. The reason being is it's lightweight and customizable, which means it's not gonna be overly resource heavy on your computer, but if you wanna add specific plugins or add additional functionality, then it's very easy to do with extensions. The only scenario where it's generally advised not to use Visual Studio Code is for the third stream, the app development stream. And this is because there are dedicated IDEs for these particular platforms such as iOS and Android. So if you wanna create applications for iOS or any Apple devices, then it's really recommended to use Xcode because this allows you to compile, run and test your application all within Xcode itself. You can even install emulators, which allows you to test this application on virtual devices, including all of the different iPhones, iPads, and then you can also obviously test it on your own Mac as well. The only real caveat to Xcode is that you actually have to own a Mac in order to be able to download this application, which means you can't really develop for Apple devices unless you're actually running it on a Mac in the first place. For Android, this limitation doesn't exist and you can install Android Studio on a Mac or on Windows, and this allows you to build applications for any Android device. So when it comes to coding, I think it's definitely worth integrating AI into your development process. And this could either be in the form of ChatGPT, where you type in specific commands, or you can even paste in code, ask it to correct it or augment it or whatever other kind of service or need that you may have. Or alternatively, you can use something like GitHub Copilot, which is built specifically for coding and uses something very similar to ChatGPT, but actually has a wider understanding of the project as a whole, 
rather than you having to actually enter in the code and paste it into ChatGPT itself. So to finish things off, I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite learning resources, which includes books, and this can help you on your learning journey, depending on which technology or which area you wanna focus on. These include general purpose books. So for example, if you just wanna become a better software engineer or coder, or you wanna understand more broadly what it means to be a software engineer, then there are books for this purpose but also I'm gonna include some specific ones which are really about specific technologies. And this can include programming languages, frameworks, or even methodologies. Feel free to pause the video on the page or the sections that are relevant for you. And do let me know in the comments if there are any areas of this video or even specific technologies that you would like me to go into, explain, and elaborate on. And lastly, there is something I wanna re-emphasize that I've covered in previous videos, which is the whole idea of becoming a better reader and writer. Because as AI becomes more and more advanced, then it kind of shifts some of the weight from being really precise in your programming languages, or at least in a way that can help you generate the code to complement them, to being precise in your written and spoken languages. I think a phrase that nicely summarizes this particular point is that the quality of the output that you get back from things such as ChatGPT is directly proportional to the quality of the input that you supply to it. Or in other words, the better the prompts in terms of being eloquent or precise, the better the output that you will get back. And this makes life a lot easier in the long run if you're able to precisely tell the AI what you want it to create, and then it can just go ahead and create it. So I hope you enjoyed this video or got something from it. If you did, then feel free to like, subscribe, let me know down below in the comment section or leave any suggestions there. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.